What we've seen in China is that they have no land acquisition costs because they just say, <laughs> guess who owns this land? The Communist <laughs> Party. And then so then the, this is a solar farm now. It was your parents' home, but now it's a solar farm. And so then they just do that. And so you see, you're seeing China install solar at breakneck paces. Now, what we don't have enough land for is wind. Wind takes much, much, much more land than solar. And if you look at the amount of land required for the wind farms that people are talking about building uh, for some of these decarbonization plans, it is not going to happen. The difference is that Japan will have a lot of pointless meetings around it where they show a bunch of pointless PowerPoints. And Texas will have a lot of stupid political rhetoric where someone gets up and says, like, batteries are Satan's energy. <laughs> Weak you know, batteries will batteries will make your kids gay, and then they'll say whatever, right? And then and then they're like, "But my house has batteries because it made me some money." Welcome to Econ One Hundred and Two, where economist Noah Smith and I make sense of what's happening in the news technology, business, and beyond through the lens of economics. Let's jump right in. Noah, welcome to the pod. Hey, thanks for having me on. We're going to kick you off with the question that we ask all of our guests to start, which is what you think the pie chart of energy sources in the US in the year 2050 looks like. The pie chart of energy. So are you talking about total energy or are you talking about electrics, electricity, electric power? We, we leave it open. We leave it open on purpose. We've gotten some good answers by leaving it open there. Because you get different responses depending on what people assume you mean. Maybe you make synthetic fuels. Maybe you electrify more yep. stuff. It's just a more open-ended, more open-ended. So total, total energy. What do I think? We'll the, and energy. what was the year again? Remind me. 2050. Oh, 2050. Okay. So um, let's see. It will be about 20% oil. Um about um let's see 20 25 percent gas um about four to five percent uh nuclear hydro and other like miscellaneous renewable sources and the rest will be uh solar and wind this is why we're doing this episode. So yeah, the, the point of this episode, we're doing this podcast on, on nuclear fission and fusion. The point of this one is to get takes from people who completely or partially disagree with us. Um, and, and you've written a bunch of good pieces on why you're bullish on solar, why you're bullish on batteries, why you're bullish on the combination of those two, why solar is happening and nuclear is mostly not. So I'd love to start with your argument on why nuclear is not happen happening and why you think that's uh, maybe more hopeless than some of the other people that we've spoken to. Right. So, so the answer to why nuclear is not happening there is actually twofold. Um, there's the question of why didn't nuclear happen in the past? And there's a question of why won't nuclear happen in the future uh, much, uh, uh, you know, more than, more than a bit. Um, the reason why it didn't happen in the past is mostly just regulation. So if you look at... Um, well, well, okay. So, so a lot of it is regulation. If you if you look at France, France built a ton of nuclear power. You know, ran more than seventy percent of its grid on nuclear power. Uh, so obviously, it's possible. the The thing that was the other thing that was hard for nuclear power in the past, besides regulatory, you know, uh, streamlining and approval, was financing. Because nuclear power, a nuclear power plant is large. It requires a huge amount of upfront financing and the payoff is measured in decades. And that is not the kind of thing that you can go to and get a loan from the bank for. And it is not even the kind of thing you can really borrow from the bond markets for. So when you looked at GE and, and Westinghouse and the other people who were building these nuclear plants back in the mid-century, mid-20th century, you saw massive government financing of these things. And that's another reason for France's success is because if there's a country that's willing to do massive government financing of industrial projects, it is France. Um, they love government in France. They, they will have the government do anything. And so, um, and so uh, that was another reason why nuclear didn't take off here as much as it should have. Uh, but, uh, but, you know, regulation, of course, is, that's a story everybody sort of knows. Uh, you know, people got afraid of, of Three Mile Island and whatnot. So in the 70s and 80s, nuclear really stagnated and um, things like, basically things like that. So now that's, that's the past. And those factors are still largely present. I think our government would be more willing to do a lot of the big financing now, given our, our need to decarbonize. 
Um, so that is less of a factor than before, but what's more of a factor now is cost issues. And so um, what's interesting is that apparently, for reasons that I don't un actually understand, uh, things, anything you can build in a factory and ship out is subject to a learning curve, where the more you build of it, the cheaper it gets. And so that could include prefab houses, that could include uh, you know, batteries, solar panels, whatever you can ship, right? So, so with nuclear reactors, the, the problem is you had to build them on site. And so they're more like, you know, we're, we're extremely bad at finding new ways to build skyscrapers, for example. Japan has tried everything, man. They, they, they tried robot skyscrapers. They tried, you know, robots like that climbed up the skyscrapers building it. They tried everything and it, nothing worked because you can't build a skyscraper in a factory and ship it. Um, and so it was on site, and so they couldn't get the cost down. So this is a big problem, and it's a thing that not many people know about. But um, so there's there's teams of people who work on sort of forecasting of learning curves. So Doyne Farmer is a guy. He was a hedge fund guy actually, and then uh, then went to to energy forecasting. And so it turns out that anything that you have to build on site doesn't tend to have much of a learning curve. And this also applies to mining and anything that you have to do in on site. So like if you look at minerals prices, you know they they're about the same. They, they really, um, they, they stay flat. We have some productivity improvements, but they largely cancel out the sort of the, the mining out the easy to get stuff early on. It's, so it's, um, so that going forward is going to be a big problem for nuclear because the cost is not really going down. And so for a while in South Korea, so, so at first the cost was going down in the United States and then it started bending and going up. South Korea has experienced a similar path, you know, South for years when South Korea was starting to build nuclear, they were getting better and better at it. And people were like, oh, South Korea does, has a learning curve. Well, well then it stopped. <laughs> and, um, and so the, the problem is that nuclear doesn't seem to have this learning curve that a lot of the other energy sources have. But I will note, by the way, that this is not, that, that this is not as bad a thing as it used to be. So, so in, the, in the 70s and 80s, our failure to build nuclear was very bad for us. But in the going forward, our failure to build nuclear will be more about the availability of even cheaper alternatives than nuclear um, that also have the other characteristics we want, such as not producing carbon dioxide. Um, so it's, it's a sense of like, yes, nuclear is good, but we invented something even better in, in most ways. And, um, and so that's going to be a thing going forward. So, so yes, there's no learning curve for nuclear, but that's not the worst... It's no longer the, the really terrible catastrophic news for us. It would have been great had we been able to build nuclear in the 70s and 80s um, like France did, but we didn't, and that sucks. Um, but going ahead, we've, got, we, we've invented some other cheaper stuff. Yeah, no, great to meet you, by the way, Julia here. Oh, great to meet you. Sorry if that was too long of a rant. No, I love it. I wanted to, I wanted to just follow up on what you talked about with the learning curves and we we've seen it in the data right construction we've gotten actually worse at building in the last few decades and manufacturing we've gotten better as a country right we're more productive there how do how do you think about the fact that we can build some other large infrastructure think like oil and gas projects like the big drilling rigs the even just like building coal plants natural gas plants versus a nuclear plant is there something that is like so complex about nuclear is it actually a regulation thing like we've just overregulated it and now we have to have, you know build a million extra safety features on the plant or, or what is it about nuclear in particular that that makes it just like so exorbitantly costly to build well first of all nothing because um you don't have learning curves for gas plants or coal plants either those are similar in their lack of learning curve they just started out cheaper and they're not that much cheaper than nuclear they're like a bit cheaper than nuclear um but but like nuclear is a little more expensive than like a gas plant or coal plant, but it's not prohibitively so. Um, so you don't see learning curves with these other uh, construction projects either that are built on site. You're not seeing gas plants go like that. You're not seeing coal plants go like that. You did see some learning curves for the machinery used for fracking because that was built in a factory. Um, now that's mostly stopped, but it got, that got fracking pretty cheap. You know, the, the machines, the big pumps that you use to pump the liquid in and, and the things you used to catch the gas, those you could, you could build cheaper, but that's, that's mostly done now. That was during, that was also during like the seventies and eighties, but that got a lot cheaper. Um, and so, so really 
you know, there, there's no advantage that those things have over nuclear besides being a little cheaper to start with. Now, there are a few extra considerations you have with nuclear. Yes, there's safety regulation. But uh, uh, what seems to be a fair amount of what people call safety regulation is not, um, you know, people thinking like, oh, my God, Fukushima. Oh, my God, Chernobyl. Right. It's um, it's oh, my God, 9-11. So what you see is you have now to build nuclear, you have to buy a whole lot of land, a huge amount of land for a perimeter that you can patrol with security. Uh, you know, and that's, that's labor costs to do that security patrol to make sure that terrorists don't get in and destroy a nuclear plant. And the, the cost for security went up crazy amounts after 9-11, after we thought, oh, hmm, what else could terrorists bomb a nuclear plant? And so, you know, terrorists bomb a, a solar farm or a, a gas plant, maybe a gas plant could cause like an explosion, but like, it's not going to do that much. Right. And then um, it'll just have some fires. And then, um, you know, they bomb a solar farm and like you get nothing except broken solar panels. Yay. Um, <laughs> but then like <laughs> bomb a nuclear plant and then you get contamination and everyone's scared. Everyone's like, oh my God. And then so, so nuclear plants are very vulnerable to, to terrorism in that sense. And so you have these giant perimeters. And so people, I, one funny thing that, that I hear when people talk about nuclear power is the idea that nuclear power is extremely energy dense. Right. They, they're just think, they're thinking about the fuel, you know. Oh, yeah. You got a little little uranium pellet, a little plutonium pellet that has so much energy and just this little tiny thing. Well, OK, fine. But what's the size of the machinery that's used to extract that? And what's the size of the land that you have to use to establish a security perimeter around that machinery so that terrorists don't come blow it up? And so then the the denominator of your energy density, your density per volume, the, the volume must include the extraction machinery and the security perimeter uh, if you're really comparing apples to apples here. So that's, um, yeah, you've probably heard people talk about like energy density. Well, think about that denominator. And so... Um, so yeah, safety regulation includes anti-terrorism security. Hey everybody, Eric here with a word from our sponsors. If you're a startup founder or executive running a growing business, you know that as you scale, your systems break down and the cracks start to show. If this resonates with you, there are three numbers you need to know. 36,000, 25, and one. 36,000, that's the number of businesses which have upgraded to NetSuite by Oracle. NetSuite is the number one cloud financial system, streamline accounting, financial management, inventory, HR, and more. 25. NetSuite turns 25 this year. That's 25 years of helping businesses do more with less, close their books in days, not weeks, and drive down costs. One, because your business is one of a kind, so you get a customized solution for all your KPIs in one efficient system with one source of truth. Manage risk, get reliable forecasts, and improve margins. Everything you need, all in one place. Right now, download NetSuite's popular KPI checklist designed to give you consistently excellent performance, absolutely free, and netsuite.com slash 102, netsuite.com slash 102 to get your own KPI checklist, netsuite.com slash 102. The holidays and the end of the year are always a good time for two things, helping those less fortunate than us and finding ways to lower our tax liability. Nothing brings those two things together better than being charitable. That's why I'm excited to partner with Daffy for this episode. Daffy is a modern platform for all your charitable giving. With Daffy, it's so much easier to put money aside for charity regularly. You can make your tax-deductible contributions all at once, or you can set aside a little each week or month. And you don't just have to donate cash. You can easily donate stock, index funds, mutual funds, or crypto. Then you can give to more than 1.5 million charities, schools, and faith-based organizations with a couple of taps. My favorite part about Daffy is that it lets you be more strategic with your giving and your tax planning. Plus, you never have to track receipts from your donations again. Daffy does it all for you. So if you're trying to get in those charitable deductions in by December 31st or just want a better system for giving, try Daffy. It's free to get started, and they are giving Econ 102 listeners a free $25 to give to the charity of your choice. Go to daffy.org slash econ 102. That's daffy.org slash econ 102 for a free $25 to give to your favorite charity. I would love to hear now the bull case for solar and solar plus batteries. What's happened? What are people like Vivek, Great. Or whatever you call them missing? Yeah. So the first thing that happened with solar panels was that uh, the government funded a whole lot of research into how to make solar panels better. And for many years, people who were skeptics of solar uh, said, we need a new, new um, 
more efficient types of solar panels like perovskites. There are materials that can make solar panels more efficient out there. We need those. Um, it turned out we did not. Uh, simple silicon, you know, did the trick. Um, and there were lots and lots of ways that we could make those panels more efficient. So you see up until the mid 2000s, you see massive improvements in the technology of efficiency, technological efficiency of solar. And that was mostly driven by government funded research, mostly in the United States. And, um, and then you see the switch over where solar panels don't get cheap yet, but they get cheap enough that people start to install more of them. And then your learning curve takes over because factories are, you know, uh, private companies are scaling up. They're, they're leveraging economies of scale. And they're also learning by doing, they're learning, you know, they're like, oh, we could just do this instead and that blah, blah, blah. And so then you see that. Um, and so solar panels got insanely cheap. And, and um, there were, there were some other factors too, you know, um, in the in, around like 2010 or 2011, you saw China massively subsidize solar panels. And then you see like this little dip where it's, it's going down, 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 and then it like dips a little more, but then that stops after like a year or something when they stop those subsidies. Uh, so, but primarily the factor behind solar panel cost decrease was just learning curves. And so then, then you get all the harder stuff, um, which is called balance of system costs. Uh, so you have to buy the land, for the solar power and then you have to get some people to install it and maintain it and blah 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 and then you have to recycle the thing after its life so we're seeing cost improvements in almost all those things um except land acquisition that's the the one thing that you don't see you don't really see cost improvements in um but then you see cost improvements in installation like uh so if you look at balance of system costs they've been declining at a much gentler slope than the manufacturing but basically panels are dirt cheap panels are a commodity you can get solar panels for free. Now it's like too cheap to meter, right? But but the the installation costs have been going down and the maintenance costs, um, but not super fast, like pretty steadily. And then the the land cost, you know, is still the the big cost. And going forward, that is going to be the main continued barrier to putting to just making an economy based on solar. What we've seen in China is that they have no land acquisition costs because they just say. <laughs> guess who owns this land the communist <laughs> party and then so then the, this is a solar farm now it was your parents home but now it's a solar farm and so then they just do that and so you see, you're seeing china install solar at breakneck paces this is not about subsidizing panels panels are already dirt cheap this is not about cheap installation labor the china's labor is not especially cheap anymore uh this is about land in china they can just put put it wherever they want america is installing solar power at, an, at a fast and accelerating rate, but nothing near where China is. And, and Europe is installing more too. And the, the, as you would expect, the main problem is that we have a much, much more laborious process of land acquisition, right? Of course, that's going to hit everything else. That's going to hit coal and gas and nuclear too. Uh, probably gas the least because gas is really small um because no one no one puts a giant security perimeter around a gas boiler um until one day some dipshit decides to blow one up and then we'll have maybe we'll have security perimeters on every gas boiler just like we have to take off our shoes because that one guy who I thought he could the bomb with his shoe the worst terrorist of all time yeah. worst terrorist of all time and 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 you know in japan they don't take off their shoes really japan the security obsessed safety obsessed super careful super detail oriented country, obsessed. no one takes off their shoes yeah, yeah. <laughs> they just you just walk on the plane because they're like and you're like oh aren't you worried i could have a bomb in my shoe and they're like no <laughs> no that's dumb and so no. anyway but <laughs> land is is still that that's the biggest barrier to, to solar power here is is land we're, we're slowly solving it um you know there's lots of workarounds like building on government land the government owns like more than half the land in the american west we can build stuff there on government land. We can build next to highways where you already have sort of the right of way. Um, you can build, there's a lot of things you can do. And, uh, and ultimately, um, you know, it comes down to a NIMBY problem to build solar, but that's going to hit pretty much all energy sources as well. And so we're just, you know, we're, we're solving that. But all the other costs got real cheap. And, um, and so that's, that's the, the main story of solar. And so then, of course, there's the question of like, storage for solar right because solar uh there's a thing called night sometimes 
our, our world turns and sometimes there's a giant ball of rock between us and the sun and you can't see the sun and like where do you get your energy then the answer is that you have to store it up for the night <laughs> and um and to a, to a much lesser extent you have to store some up for the winter right because winter you get less sun but that's not so big a problem the big pro the big thing is just night right um and so so storage has to be part of you know solar and the question is how do you store all that energy so that's the 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 big question is um that is you know we're we're we've come up with lots of answers to that which answer will prevail is still uh you know up in the air um in a lot of places they're just doing you know they're just using electricity to pump water uphill and then letting it run downhill at night it's called pumped hydro um it's um it's not the it, it's like you need a lot of land for it you, and and some places are better than others for it yeah uh, you need to pump a lot of water and so so now you know so of course batteries are an obvious solution batteries are great um uh batteries have come down in cost a ton batteries have come down in cost almost as much as solar has come down in cost and that's why people are switching to electric cars right now and so the question is could we use battery storage for the grid now you can't use quite the same kind of battery for the grid that you use for a car it's just got to be a different kind of battery and so there's about five different kinds of batteries that people are now debating about and that are sort of competing with each other to see which will provide grid storage and it has to do both with material availability reliability scalability all these things complicated stuff and you should probably get a technological expert in batteries to come on here uh, oh you should get uh, sam d'amico to come on here oh yeah yeah the the impulse guy yeah yeah he's he's he will talk your off about batteries all day but yeah so 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 battery storage is another option right and then people are playing with some other stuff but honestly it's probably just going to be batteries uh, if you look at the the cost now to buy a battery to to run your solar power you know to store to store up your solar power and run your electricity at night it's actually pretty cheap so solar plus batteries now battery storage now is cheaper than natural gas everywhere in america but california um where it is expensive because of land costs which we well know um but everywhere else in all the other like regional grids it's cheaper but that's not going to last as we as we build more and more um you know the the battery that will that will push up the cost of battery storage as we build more and more of it because we will not exploit the easy places to build and blah 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 so at the same time we're going to have the race of technology where battery storage is just getting cheaper and cheaper at this what still looks like a very like exponential rate um and so you know so so i think battery storage is just going to win after looking at the, some of the numbers here but i can't pull up those numbers now and i'm also not an expert in this field and so uh i know that that you know people like jesse jenkins who whose whole job is to like forecast what and model what our energy mix is going to be uh are not completely sold that batteries are going to be like this you know silver bullet solution to everything but i'd say if i had to guess i'd say that they will be more than i'm more confident than than him but i'm less of an expert than him so you should rely on him more <laughs> Yeah, no, I wanted to, I wanted to um, dive in a little bit further on this. The intermittency problem around renewables is, I think, one of the big contrasting points to nuclear, right, which you can run 24-7. Today, today you pair, people pair renewables often with gas peaker plants, for example. Right. Maybe talk, talk a little bit about what you think the curve's going to look like. Where are we at today in terms of, you know, what percentage of renewables or solar are paired with storage? Um, and where do you think, like what, you know, where are we headed on that over the next decade or towards 2050, which we were talking about earlier? So, so gas peaker plants, um, are fine. They're small. They're, uh, they're expensive. They're, they're not expensive, but they are expensive because they idle most of the time. So, so, but they're fine. You know, you don't need much, you don't need much of it. It's just a little at, like additional thing you add onto your, your thing. So gas peaker plants. And it, from the standpoint of we must eliminate carbon entirely, we must have zero carbon in our entire economy. Well, that's never going to happen except in people's models, right? Um, what's going to happen is we'll get carb, we'll we'll eliminate ninety percent of carbon and pull the rest out of the air with direct air capture, 
or 85 percent or something like that that's what's actually going to happen um people don't want to don't want to believe that yet but that's you know the idea of a hundred percent decarbonized economy will not happen so gas speaker plants are actually fine because they 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 don't actually put out that much carbon so from a climate gas speaker plants aren't going to kill our planet right uh, so so they're fine you know they're fine um one by the way uh one technological disadvantage of nuclear in terms of a complement to solar is that you can't use nuclear as a peaker plant. Nuclear uh, takes a long time to turn on and off uh, currently, right? The, the current kind of nuclear that we use takes a long time to turn on and off um, because our, I could go on a rant about how the way we build nuclear plants is like very dumb and stone age and someday someone needs to invent a better way and they will. Oh, I'd love to. Yet. What's your vision for uh, for better nuclear power plants? I love that. Well, okay. So let me tell you a little anecdote. Uh, when I was a kid, I watched this show called uh, Robotech, which was about planes that transform into robots. It was a space space opera, and there are, everyone's after this this magical energy source called protoculture that will just power everything forever and just infinite energy source, right? And so they're like, um, and so I was we I was talking to my friends and I was like, well, how do you, how does protoculture produce all this energy? And so one of my friends says, well, okay. So first the protoculture produces heat, which you use to boil water, which you use to turn a turbine. <laughs> and um, that's your, that's your space energy source. That is how uh, nuclear works. Nuclear works. A, a nuclear plant that we currently have is a slowed down nuclear bomb is a slow it's a no it's not it's a slowed down it's a slowed down dirty bomb it's not it's not a critical it's not even that kind of fuel it won't blow you up but it's a the reason it can like have a meltdown is because it is a chain reaction we and we take have a chain reaction and then you have this chain reaction going on and then you slow it down by sticking metal things that absorb the neutrons and sort of dampen the chain reaction just enough so that it keeps going but that's not the kind of thing you can easily turn on and off like a chain reaction is not a thing you can easily turn on and off and so the fact that we're building these nuclear plants, the, the, the nuclear power relies on like a, a, a dampened chain reaction is, is kind of an L for nuclear power. Because in, in the 1940s, that's the best we could think of, right? Well, it's not the 1940s anymore. We're smarter now. We have chat GPT. We can <laughs> think of something. We could think of something better than this. And, um, and there are ideas for how to do things better than this and they just need more research we need more research funding for something better than like you know dampened a chain reaction that boils water into steam and turns a turbine come on guys anyway um <laughs> well it may still be steam <laughs> all right so but i guess the point here is nuclear plants you can't turn on and off easily and so that makes it you can't use it as a peaker plant so you either use nuclear or you use solar plus a peaker plant, solar plus a battery, solar plus pumped hydro, you know, um, all these other things. And so, but, but peaker plants aren't going to kill us. They're just, they're a little expensive because they don't get used most of the time. It's, it's a, it's a gas plant you don't use most of the time and that doesn't amortize well. So, but it's not big, right? So, so gas, so solar plus peaker is still pretty cheap because the peaker plant's not particularly big. And so, so that's fine unless you're, you know, a crusading, unless you're one of the people like splashing paint on paintings because you want to like get zero carbon energy now. I hate my dad, you know, unless you're one of those doofuses, then you realize that like we just need to decarbonize most of the way as soon as we can and figure out the rest later. That's the smart way to do things. And so peaker plants are not scaring me. Yeah. Hey, everybody. Eric here with a word from our sponsors. Have you ever wondered where your donation could have the most impact? In 2007, a group of donors had that exact question. But when they sought out information from charities to help them answer this question, they instead received cute pictures or unhelpful stories. Their experience led them to create GiveWell, an organization providing rigorous, transparent research about the best giving opportunities they've found. GiveWell has now spent over 15 years researching charitable organizations and only directs funding to a few of the highest impact opportunities they've found in global health and poverty alleviation. Over 100,000 donors have used GiveWell to donate more than $1 billion. Rigorous evidence suggests that these donations will save over 150,000 lives and improve the lives of millions more. GiveWell wants as many donors as possible to make informed decisions about high impact giving. You can find all of their research and recommendations on their site for free. You can make tax-deductible donations to their recommended funds or charities, and GiveWell doesn't take a cut. 
If you've never donated through GiveWell before, you can have your donation matched up to $100 before the end of the year, or as long as matching funds last. To claim your match, go to GiveWell.org, pick podcast, and enter Econ 102 at checkout. Make sure they know that you heard about GiveWell from Econ 102 to get your donation matched. Again, that's GiveWell.org to donate or find out more. Intermittency is, is most, there's actually two intermittency problems. So when people talk about intermittency, um, they, they conflate two different things. The first intermittency problem is night. Um, storms are actually just fancy night, <laughs> um, like a, a really dark cloud. So, so when it's cloudy, solar plants still work. Um, you know, people are like, it only works when the sun is shining. No, it doesn't. The sun shines through, the sun shines through clouds. That's why you can still see outside and it still runs your solar plant. Your power goes down a little bit, but you carry out your solar calculator on a cloudy day. It still works just fine. And you will still get skin cancer if you go out without sunscreen all the time on a cloudy days. Sorry, Seattle people. Uh, you're still going to get skin <laughs> cancer. Sorry, London people. But anyway, um, the, the sun still shines, but sometimes you get a storm that's so dark, it really does block the, the solar panel, right? A thunderstorm rolling across the plains of Nebraska and it's really dark and then it blocks most of your solar. But that's just fancy night. That's just an unplanned night. But if you have a battery that can store solar, you know, battery storage, there's also the idea that batteries leak a lot. And I actually thought this for a long time before I looked at the amounts and it's like, what? Over a year, you're leaking like 15% of your energy. Hmm. That's not much. That's really not much over a whole year. Um, so, so batteries to store up power for like night also work for storms very well. The reason, so the, the other intermittency problem is, is seasonal storage, right? Winter, uh, you know, you've got your little planet and it's tilted and then you're angled away from the sun and the sun has to hit you at a shallow angle. And so you don't get as much sun. Um, that is the tyranny of orbital geometry. If you, um, you know, the only, the only way to fix that is to like change the axis of our I'm sure Elon Musk is working on this right now. Yeah. Um, so then <laughs> eliminate winter. But, um, but yeah, so you have winter, right? When the sun shines less. So the obvious thing to do is like just build more solar, <laughs> just build more. And you can do that to some extent when you can get the land, right? So panels are dirt cheap. So if you can get the land, you just build more solar, you overbuild. And if you overbuild by a factor of 1.6, you can take care of all of seasonal storage, basically. And yeah. then you don't have to worry about winter. Winter's not a thing anymore. You can't always build, overbuild by a factor of 1.6 because you can't always get the land for that. So seasonal storage can include, um, think, you know, if we can get really cheap batteries for seasonal storage, we can do that. Um, basically, it's, it's a smaller problem um, because the sun still shines somewhat in the winter. So, so technically, you could eliminate the need for seasonal storage if you just build more solar if you can get the land yeah. um but then when, if and when you can't in the situations where you can't get the land you can build like batteries hold their charge really really well so you can you can build a battery to hold some charge for seasons it's just expensive because you you only like you use it very slowly you only use it like a little bit of the year so you're you're amortizing your cost for a, this big battery that you only use a couple times a year um and so there so people are working out Basically, no one I talk to is worried that much about seasonal seasonal storage. It's just night. It's re it's really just night that everyone's worried about, and storms are not a not a big deal because it's just fancy night. Um, so as long as you have batteries that can get you through the night, intermittency is is pretty much not a big deal. And where yeah, where maybe help us understand where are we at with that today? Like I don't know if you'd ha know these numbers offhand, but like what percentage of solar today? is paired with batteries that can last us through the night? And what's, I guess, the path to having a majority of solar having that? Well, I, I don't know that. I don't know that. Um, so I would imagine it's small. Yeah, yeah. So, so I don't actually know those numbers off the top of my head. Um, although I do know that, that uh, Texas has been having surprisingly, uh, su surprisingly good success with this. Because first of all, it turns out that one cool thing about batteries is that um, coal plants and gas plants get not often get knocked out by storms and cold. There are places in Texas that get cold. I know you think there's not. <laughs> there are. Um, so, but but coal and gas plants often get knocked offline because they, you know, uh, especially gas because you have these big pipes pumping all this gas from place to place, um, and those can freeze up 
but batteries turn out to be really resilient. So, um, oh, also heat. So extreme heat can knock out a lot of, uh, of, of, you know, standard energy, fossil fuel energy plants. Um, it can also knock out nuclear and I don't know why that should work. That should happen. Um, but it does apparently. And so, so I haven't actually looked into the technological reasons for why heat can knock out a nuclear plant, um, which it, that's weird, but apparently batteries do really well in the heat. Um, partly because they're buried, you know, they're yeah. underground, so they're not subject to the heat as much. Um, but all, uh, apparently like I thought batteries did really badly in heat, you know, and like my phone battery, when it gets hot, it loses, it, it, it lose the charge maybe it's just because they're buried and so they they you know they they hide in the ground from the heat like a animal you know <laughs> so i'm um, like a little furry creature burrowing like a rabbit burrowing in the ground yeah i bet you they're staying right at that ground level and and actually not getting the extreme hot or cold because batteries actually do terribly in the cold yeah 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 um but it but it turns out that batteries apparently work really well in the winter because keeping them warm is actually pretty easy because batteries throw off some heat and you can use that heat to actually heat the battery itself if you just redirect something. But anyway, yeah. um, it turns out that batteries are a lot better at surviving a lot of these things than I thought that they were. And so they're pretty good. And Texas found that out. Um, basically, I, so, so I, I um, come from Texas and I've lived in Japan for a while. And I strongly believe in the power of Japan and Texas together to find things that work because California will be the last to implement anything that works, anything effective. California will be the last, be it math education, energy, or property taxes, <laughs> um, whereas, uh, you know, or building housing, California will be the last. They are not a trendsetter in anything that works because they have all this sunshine and all these and tech clusters and all these things that give them free money. And so they, you know, they don't feel pressure to do what works. Texans are just like, well, this, this made me some money. So, uh, so I did it, you know, <laughs> and, and Japan is like PowerPoint, PowerPoint, PowerPoint. Here's a PowerPoint Here's showing an incredibly intricate little diagram for why this works. And then, and then they're okay, okay, it works. Ah, and then like, <laughs> so, so Japan and Texas are very, are very pragmatic places in terms of their political economy. They will, if there is a technological solution that works, they'll just do it. And the difference is that Japan will have a lot of pointless meetings around it where they show a bunch of pointless PowerPoints and Texas will have a lot of stupid political rhetoric where someone gets up and says like batteries are Satan's energy. <laughs> we, you know, batteries will, batteries will make your kids gay and then they'll say whatever. Right. And then, and then they're like, but my house has batteries cause it made me some money. <laughs> like that's that's the Texan attitude. This is this is going to be a narrative podcast where we're kind of taking quotes from each person that we talk to. So I think for this episode, we're actually good. We're just going to do the batteries are gay quote, uh, yeah. and then <laughs> batteries will turn your kids gay. Yeah. It's like Texans say the dumbest things in in political speeches, like absolutely unbelievably dumb. It's just like oh my god, and but then they the Texan business people then go and just do whatever makes money and are super pragmatic. You know, they, they do, you know, what be that building housing, building, you know, any form of energy that works, you know, whatever, whatever it takes investing in tech industry, they will just do it. And, you know, and it's just totally divorced from the silly rhetoric that they have. And that's, you have to understand Texan culture to, to reconcile their behavior with their rhetoric. But once you understand that they're just, they're just, you know, BSing and in fact, they'll just do whatever makes them money, then you understand Texas. And so, so it's, gr it's been great to watch Texas, um, you know, build all these batteries and the batteries are, are, have worked for them very well this past summer. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's too early to tell whether that's replicable in other climates, like whether or not you can have the battery storage just as well in upstate New York, right? Or Minnesota. We'll see. Um, but it seems to be working well so far. So we'll, we'll see where that goes. Uh, but, but one thing I think that I've learned is that different climates and different political climates both have different solutions that will happen. And it's, it's, it's going to be a big mix. And that, that's true internationally as well. You know, silver, silver bullet solutions of uh, 
occasionally you do get a silver bullet solution. So like oil for cars, that was just, everyone did that everywhere and it worked everywhere because you can ship oil everywhere in a tanker. It's incredibly fungible. The storage cost is very low. You have gas stations all over the planet. It just looks the same everywhere, right? But that's an anomaly. Like that's, most places don't look like that. Coal actually didn't look like that. Natural gas actually doesn't look like that. We have fracking here, but we have weird rock that you can frack from very cheaply. China doesn't have as much fracking because it costs like five times as much to frack stuff out of their fan, out of their different kinds of rock. And so, so oil is like this one silver bullet solution that we found. You only see, that's the only example I can think of where we had one energy thing that just works everywhere. Yeah. I, I mean, I love the learning curves maybe more than anybody in the world other than you on, I think the battery is probably, you know, I think battery is probably going to get there. Like, I think those are all tech issues that we figure out. The land one does seem like, you know, seem like the biggest issue and not just now acquiring land, but like the whole world wants, you know, American standard energy. And then we want to triple our energy consumption. Like what does the land use look like? I mean, I've seen analyses that, you know, even at max solar efficiency, there's just like not enough land in the world to put solar everywhere. So like, how, how do you see that going if, if we want to increase kind of energy consumption? So I have not seen that analysis for solar. I have seen analyses of land requirements for solar and they are bigger than other forms of energy, um, although not as, nearly as much bigger as you would think, um, especially um, especially compared to nuclear with those big fences. But um, but then it's not as it's not as much as you think, but it, there is, we will have to use more land for energy. Um, uh, but I have seen analyses that say that worldwide, the amount of land we'll need for solar is not big. Like it's, it's, it's big, but it's not anywhere close to being prohibitive. Um, and of course that depends on, you know, building, building big power lines. So for example, there's these mad schemes to like build solar in the Sahara and build power lines to Europe and blah, blah, blah. That's going to be harder, right? The, maybe we could do that, uh, but it, that's going to be harder, but we've got a lot of desert and assuming we can override the political objections to building a solar panel over the home of some little lizard, right? Which will, honestly probably be glad to have the shade but um as as uh it was so so one thing about solar farms is that they're actually great for wildlife like so much it's it's a it's a it's a tree it's like a bunch right? of las umbritas yeah it's all, it's all a giant las umbrita <laughs> it's um <laughs> but unlike las umbrita it actually does block the sun um from every angle uh because that's how it gets power right las umbrita is not powered by the sun um or did they put a solar panel? I, La Sombrita is dumb. I think anyway, there might be a solar panel. On there there might be a solar <laughs> yeah. panel, but it doesn't actually work. Uh, La Sombrita is dumb and solar panels are not dumb. Uh, solar panels are actually good for wildlife, but they will slightly change the kind of wildlife that lives in a place. And there are environmentalists who care very, very deeply about this. And those people need to get a freaking hobby. And um, that's a different hobby. Go take care of rabbits. Do that instead. Anyway, go campaign for veganism and campaign against like meat. Or whatever, right? Go do that instead. If you wanna, if you wanna improve land use in this country, or in the whole world, but especially in this country, um, you should get people to eat less cow. You know, I am. This is one thing Texas will never do. I am a Texan, and I eat a lot of beef, and I love cooking beef, and I realize that it takes a heck of a lot of land. Like, if you look at the amount of the United States land that's given over to cattle grazing. It is big. It is really big. <laughs> and so then um, if you want to improve land use, just, just focus on that. But the point is that we have a lot of desert, right? And we can just put solar panels in those deserts. And if we want to run a really giant, big, thick power cable, whatever, low loss power cable from a desert to Michigan, we can do that because unlike running something, it, no one's going to come and cut it. No, no militia with some acronym that no one remembers is going to just come and be like, we cut your cable ah! and like wave their AK 47s in the air. <laughs> like that's not going to happen. I hope. Um, maybe if you routed the cable through San Francisco, this would happen. Otherwise, no. Um, <laughs> so we have enough land. Um, I have, if you have an analysis that says we don't have enough land, please show it to me because I've seen exactly the opposite. Now, what we don't have enough land for is wind. Wind takes much, much, much more land than solar. 
And if you look at the amount of land required for the wind farms that people are talking about building uh, for some of these decarbonization plans, it is, um, it is uh, to quote Monty Python, it is, sir, not appearing in this film. <laughs> like, it is not going to happen. We are not going to cover 18% of the United States landmass with wind farms. That will not happen. Um, and so wind is not going to work. Uh, and so also wind has a shallower learning curve because more of it is built on site. Um, you ship in the turbines, but then installing the turbines is, is harder. And so wind has a learning curve. It's just like much shallower than solar. Um, it's gotten somewhat cheap. And Texas, which has extremely cheap land, has built some wind. But if you look at the amount of wind, then there's offshore wind. But building stuff in the sea is hard. Do we do we know any, uh, we were talking about this before, if we need to bring somebody on to defend wind, yeah. we who's the we person who's going to defend wind for us? Oh, I don't know. Who loves wind? You could probably just post on Twitter. Just post on Twitter, like, wind power sucks. See who replies and then invite those people on the podcast. <laughs> yeah. um, just, you know, throw out some chum. Be like, wind power sucks. And then someone will be like, no, wind power is great. Uh, wind power doesn't suck. It's just a marginal thing. So, so wind power and nuclear... Uh, are both going to be part of our energy mix. They're just not going to be like most of our energy mix. Wind is going to be is going to be there, right? And hydro and geothermal is going to be there. Geothermal is amazing uh, when you have like a natural hot spot. Like like you don't have that everywhere. You don't have just like red hot magma. You know everywhere where you need the geothermal. But where you do like Iceland, Iceland runs entirely off geothermal. It's so cheap. You know, you just stick a thing in the ground. It's really easy. We have the technology. It's super cheap, um, but it only works in certain places. So geothermal is going to be part of our energy mix. Hydro, when you have a, a river, is going to be part of our, is already part of our energy mix. Wind, when you have cheap land in places where you have cheap land, is going to be part of our energy mix. Nuclear, where you have people who aren't insane about building nuclear, you know, are, is going to be part of our energy mix. And, um, and all these things are going to be part of our mix. It's just that solar has that amazing learning curve. Solar and batteries have that amazing learning curve. And so I think they're going to be a bigger part of our energy mix. They're a more scalable part of our energy mix. Then, But mm -hmm. in the end, it's going to be like a team of, of energy sources. Speaking of energy mix, what do you make of the pace that we're building solar right now? Do you think we're like working at a good pace in the U.S.? Um, should should actually be able to do more. And if we're not doing what you think would be like kind of our ideal outcome, what's standing in the way? We have mentioned land. There's probably some other things, you know, and, and, and how would you stack rank those things kind of standing in the way? Number one, land. Number two, I don't even care. It's all land. <laughs> um, it's, it's land acquisition, not just the cost, but also the availability. Like you have to go through NEPA, you know, the, the delays. Uh, NEPA or in California, you have to go through SICA, which is like, you mm. know, NEPA on a bad mm -hmm. day. Um, it's like, it's like NEPA on bath salts. Um, and so, and so, um, yeah, so, so it's all, it's all just land. Um, and and do, do you, is that like an intractable problem? Like, can we, can we solve this? No. Yeah, we can solve it. Okay. How do we um, solve it? Uh, well, it's called eminent domain. Okay. Is that the strategy <laughs> here though? That we actually have the ability to do what China does. We just don't do it often. But the, our government can absolutely do it. If you say there is a compelling public interest to build the solar thing, you say, here is where it shall be built. You're like, well, I own this land. And you're like, well, I am paying you this price for your land. I'm like, I demand a higher price for your land. I was like, no, I'm paying you this price for your land. I'm the government. I can decide what price to pay you for land because it's called eminent domain. <laughs> you and, thought and you, you had private property ownership. You know, is that realistic? Like, do you yes. think that will actually happen? Mm, it's in, in some places. In some places, it'll happen. Um, but all it has to do is happen a few times before people are like, okay, I see, I see what's going on. Um, the, the progressive industrialists like Todd Tucker and the Roosevelt Institute are all talking about the defense production act. Like how you can use defense production act to overcome like nimbyism. Hmm. Like, no, that is not what you use the defense production act for. You are dreaming. The defense production act is for, um, coordinating supply chains. The defense hmm. production act is like. It's like, hi, Ford, I need you to make masks now for COVID and yeah. instead of cars. And Ford is like, okay. And then you do that. It's like, it's, it's, it's like World War II stuff. The land acquisition happens through eminent domain. And um, we in America have, have decided to farm out every decision on land use and, and everything to the courts. Um, when you 
we need to take some of that back for the administrative state. And when we get serious enough about it, we do. And so there are cases of things where we just build stuff incredibly fast and we just, you know, we just decide, okay, we're going to build this thing. And then it just gets built. This one's, this one's so interesting. Cause I was thinking through, and I'd say this is like a two minute thought exercise. So this is not well thought out, but was thinking through when energy gets really cheap what's valuable, like when everything kind of comes down in the curve, what's valuable. And the only thing left is land, right? Like if energy gets cheap enough, if manufacturing gets good enough, if what, like the internet happens to everything, land is the only valuable thing. We're going to have this future state where solar makes energy cheap enough, but to get any more of it, we're going to have to take the most valuable thing from people. Is that, is that where, is that where the world might be going? Well, land will be one of the last remaining valuable things. Um, uh, information will still be valuable. We thought the, we thought the internet would make information free, but it turns out that disinformation is cheaper to produce. <laughs> um, yep. so you saw it today, uh, it, in a lot of search engines, when you search for tank man, the, the Chinese, you know, guy, the, the photo, you get an AI generated, uh, photo, an AI generated art of tank man taking a selfie in front of the tank. <laughs> So, so anyway, there'll be lots of things that are valuable even after energy gets cheap. Um, but, uh, land is certainly going to be one thing that people don't want to give up because it's not, you're not just talking about land. You're, you're not talking about like just a, a flat space of rock to build something on. You're talking about, um, you're talking about proximity to things. Yep. You're talking about views you know, oh, my nice view. I don't like this solar panel in my backyard. You're talking about this, um, you know, sunlight. It's like, oh, you build a skyscraper and it blocked my sunlight and I can't see. Like there's people in Manhattan now claiming, complaining about a new skyscraper because it blocks their view of a different skyscraper that they were used to looking at. <laughs> that we, we call that land cost, but it's, you know, but it's actually just it's, it's location, right? Why, why do people still pay out the ears um, money on the ears. why do people still pay out the ears to live in San Francisco when people are like smashing their cars and pooping on their doorstep? Why? Because I, of clustering. You've effects. come to the wrong place. I, I don't, <laughs> I, I don't get it. No, I've come to the right place, which is San Francisco. No. Um, so <laughs> wait, you don't live in San Francisco. No, no, personally. neither of us do. Okay. I do. And so <laughs> I live in Cerebral Valley now. I just moved to Cerebral Valley, the hottest neighborhood in the town. Um, anyway, uh, <laughs> No, the um, the reason people live in San Francisco is clustering effects. Yeah. It's so nerds can be close to other nerds. Also, it's sunlight. You know, everyone likes sunlight. And it's got nice hills and it's got the old Victorians and it's got the beach right there. But really, it's just nerds being close to other nerds. And that is why they move there. So, so a lot of the land stuff is actually just proximity to things. It's location. The, the um, you know, Georgism, Henry George and all that stuff. Yep. Yeah. And the, the problem with online Georgism is that everyone just associates Henry George just with the land taxes. I love land taxes. Land taxes are great, but there are many other tools for reducing the dominance of land over our civilization. And so for uh, one of those is in poor countries, you can do agrarian land reform. Uh, basically, you eminent domain farms and give it to farm workers. And you, uh, this, this does all kinds of great stuff for your country. Um, yes, it really does. Expropriating landlords does great things for your country. Um, and the, by the way, the greatest thing about that is that then the landlords have a whole bunch of cash and no land anymore. And so they all go start manufacturing businesses in the cities. Huh? That's like um, the story of South Korea, right? It, it is. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And, um, and, and uh, basically everywhere, uh, that does, that does land reform. Yeah. But they're all also like eminent domain, just, just deciding like, we're going to build stuff. We're going to appropriate the value of land for the public is, is amazingly powerful. Yeah. We only have, we only have five minutes left here. And I, I don't know if I know your thoughts on fusion. So I feel like I need to just get you ranting on what you think about fusion as part of the, the energy future, maybe zoom out to 2100 or however you want to answer fusion. In the long term, that's where we're going to get our energy from. You know, we're going to, fusion's hard, but eventually that is where we'll get the energy from because that's the only thing that can really take us into space easily. 
I mean, you can have solar panels on spacecraft and you will, but really it's going to be fusion that lets us zip around the solar system and it'll be a fusion reactor that we plop down in Europa or wherever that we colonize and all this stuff. That's all going to be, that's all going to have to be fusion. And ultimately, um, we will be able to shrink our land, the land footprint of our energy use. If the long-term uh, future of human civilization is basically we all live in awesome Tokyo type cities and then the rest of the world gets rewilded and we just go there to like hike and do outdoor and rock climb and do outdoorsy stuff. That's the future of humanity. That's the good future. That's the future we must build uh, where we, we rewild most of the world and use it for outdoorsy sports and fun. And then we live in awesome cities like Tokyo where we get to go to like a new cool art gallery every week. And then, um, and, and, uh, and yet live in oddly large houses in the middle of Tokyo because you can do that. Hmm. But that's, that's our future. And in that future, we're going to use fusion to reduce our land footprint, right? We just have to figure out how fusion is going to work. You know, there's 20 different fusion companies and, and I'd say that they're, they're steady progress, but they're not there yet. Um, but it will get there. Uh, there's a guy named Will Jack that you should have on your show. Um, he is a, a, like a fusion VC He's doing fusion VC stuff and his, his wife is like a top fusion engineer person. Um, and so they, they will talk your ear off about all the awesomeness of fusion, but, uh, but yeah, that, that's our long-term energy future is fusion. It's gotta be. If the stars use it, why wouldn't we use it? Amen. <laughs> yeah. Ultimately solar power, solar power is just secondhand fusion. It's inefficient fusion. Yeah. It's inefficient fusion. And, um, inefficient land intensive fusion so ultimately we'll make our own little stars i love it that's a great place to end noah thanks for joining us today thank you for having me on see you later <laughs>